الله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله تعالى على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم رضيت بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم رسولا ونبيا رب أعوذ بك من همزات الشياطين وأعوذ بك رب أن يحضرون ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم uh, Picking up from the uh, legendary military empire of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم from page number 353 as we have already mentioned in a narration with an authentic chain Abu Zar رضي الله عنه became afraid of conflict when he saw so many people gathering around him He mentioned this to Umar Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anhu and it seemed as if he was requesting permission to leave. Uthman said to him, if you wish, you can move and still stay close to us. Uh, moving along now to the next page, 18.2. The lie that Ibn Sabah, or the lie that Ibn Sabah affected Abu Zar. Abu Zar was not influenced in any way by the opinions of the Jew Abdullah ibn Sabah. He stayed in Arabada until his death and he did not participate in any of the conflicts that took place. In fact, he was amongst those who narrated hadith forbidding involvement in those type of conflicts altogether. 18.3 Abu Zar passes away and Uthman established kinship with his family in the campaign of Tabuk. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told that Abu Dhar had fallen behind because his camel had slowed him down. He said, leave him. If there is good in him, Allah will reunite him with us. If there is not, Allah has relieved you of him. Abu Dhar lingered on his camel. When it became too slow, he took his gear, carried it on his back, and continued following the traces of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on foot. Uh, Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, stopped at a resting place. And when one of the Muslims saw someone coming, he said, let it be Abu Dhar. They kept looking until they said, Allah's Messenger, it is by Allah, jalla jalaluhu Abu Dhar. He said, may Allah Jalla Jalaluhu have mercy on Abu Dhar. He walks alone, dies alone, and is resurrected alone. A sound hadith recorded by Al-Hakim. Time passed and the era of Uthman came. And Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu settled in Arabada. When he realized that death was about to overtake him, he instructed his wife and slave, saying, When I die, wash me and shroud me, then carry me and put me in the middle of the road. Say to the first ones who pass you, this is Abu Dhar. When he died, they did as they had been requested. When the first group of people arrived, they almost rode on his bearer. For they did not know he was there. It turned out to be Ibn Mas'ud and a group of men from Kufa. Radiallahu Ta'ala anhum. They asked, what is this? They were told, it is the bearer of Abu Dhar. Hearing this, Ibn Mas'ud carried out, or cried out rather, and wept, saying, the messenger of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu spoke the truth when he said, may Allah Jalla Jalaluhu have mercy on Abu Dhar. He walks alone, dies alone, and is resurrected alone. They washed and shrouded him, prayed the funeral prayer, and finally buried him. When they were about to leave, his daughter said to them, Abu Dhar sends you his greetings. He swore that you would not leave until you had eaten. Thus they ate and then left for Mecca, where they informed Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anhu about what had happened. He made Abu Dhar's daughter part of His family. Does that mean that he married her or not? That's not uh, clarified here. They just said he made his daughter part of his family and how he did it is not clear. So moving along now to chapter 19. The importance of studying the incidents surrounding Uthman's murder and the wisdom of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in foretelling this turmoil. 19.1. The importance of studying the incidents surrounding Uthman radiallahu anhu's assassination and its consequences such as the battles of the camel 
and Sifin. Many of our pious forefathers and scholars have forbidden us from delving into the details of what happened among the companions. They have commanded us to leave this matter to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu and we should only be pleased with them and believe that each of them will be rewarded for participating in their best judgment insha'Allah. We have been warned about slandering and discrediting them because that leads to a disregard for the Sharia and invokes Allah Jalla Jalaluhu's anger. So do not do this. This is all disclosure. After all, the companions are the ones who conveyed the Sharia to us. However, if our intention is only to study and research for the purpose of acquiring knowledge, there should be no problem with the discussing or discussing these matters and studying them in detail as long as uh, there is no fear at all that it will lead to discrediting them in any way one can go ahead and deepen his or her understanding of this conflict in its reasons fine details consequences and effects on the society of the companions and those who came after them such scholars as Ibn Kathir and At-Tabari have written about this difficult period in our history and gone into detail about many issues related to the conflict. However, some of them have declared one or both of the parties to be mistaken, relying upon the many authentic and inauthentic texts that have been narrated on this matter. The following are some of the reasons why scholars and students should thoroughly study the conflict that took place in the early days of Al-Islam. Contemporary works uh, or contemporary works on the conflict, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, between the companions and their successors fall into three categories. Category A, works of authors who have been brought up to think like the Westerners since they either harbor ill feeling towards or and are arrogant about the history of Al-Islam ignorant, excuse me, about the history of Islam. They do not relate anything positive about it. They tend to slander the companions and their successes in a way that serves the interests of the enemies of Al-Islam, who have studied this conflict in detail and explained it in ways that discredit the masses of the companions and that strike Islam right at its very roots. They like to make it seem that the conflict was all about politics, status, and position, thus disregarding the faith and sincerity of the companions, radiallahu ta'ala, and whom this, this, this capable or the capacitates material makes up the sources quoted by the Orientalists and other enemies of Al Islam in their books. Then come to the members of the morally defeated generation who see a fine example in the West and who absorb whatever the Orientalist pen has written, making it their main source of history. This has had a serious effect on the Muslim today way of thinking and their cultural heritage. For this reason, studying the views of the Orientalists and their connection with Shiism is a very important matter that deserves our attention. After all, the non muslim enemy has utilized the doubts and fabrication of the Rafidis against Al-Islam and the Muslims since the time of Imam Ibn Hazim. B. Works of some contemporary Muslim scholars. These books are beneficial in general. However, there is a lot of or at least some unfairness in the way they present the historical incidents and explain the position of some companions and their successors. Works of scholars C. Who attempted to follow the methodology of hadith criticism. This methodology means analyzing historical reports according to the principles of hadith scholars. The authors study the chain and text of each narration separating the weak from the authentic. These works are commendable and constitute a praiseworthy effort in confronting the fabrications and explaining historical incidents in an appropriate manner. That does not nullify the virtue and faith of the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum among these fine works is the book of yusuf al ashari or ash ashi on the history of the mayat state the 
marginal notes of Mahidin al Khatib al Awasim min al Qawasim by Abu Bakr ibn al Arabi, Uthman ibn Affan by Sadiq Arjun. Abdullah ibn Saba wa atharuhu fi ahadith al-fitnati fi sadri al-islam by Sulaiman ibn Hamd al-Awda' tahqiq mawaqif al-sahaba fi fitnan by Dr. Muhammad Amkhuzun al-khilafat al-rashidin by Akram al-Umari يقبا بن التاريخ also another very important by Uthman al-Khamis al-Madina al-Munawwara Fajr al-Islam wal-Asr al-Rashidi by Muhammad Hassan Shuraba and the informative analysis in contemporary of Muhib al-Din al-Tabari on al-Muntaqa After what has been mentioned, it becomes clear that we we direly need more works that refute these false claims and errors. The fabricators of al Islamic history can only be refuted by a thorough study of the incidents that took place by analyzing different narrations using the scale of hadith criticism through which the authentic and good are separated from the weak and the fabricated Ibn Taymiyyah states, however. When an innovator appears and criticizes them with baseless proofs, their honor must be defended by refuting these claims with knowledge and justice. <clears throat> We should be aware of what really caused the term oil and whether there were internal or external reasons behind it. We also need to know the major and minor reasons behind the conflict. If one reads about the turmoil, one can easily sense a major conspiracy behind it. The Magians, Christians, Jews, and hypocrites all cooperated in making it work. It was the plotting of the enemies of Al-Islam against the Muslim Ummah. Still, even after understanding the nature of the conspiracy, it must be realized that it would have never succeeded had the Muslims not been divided and weak internally. It is n- not then apt to say... That studying the era of the companions is obligatory so that we can find out the reasons for the weakness of our ummah. Through this, we can find out the fabricators behind this unity and how they came into being. Or we can find out the factors behind the disunity and how they came into being. This information can then be used to rectify our current situation and avoid committing the same mistakes or... Are we truly destined to continue struggling against these internal problems along with the scheming of our external enemies? Uh, very good questions. All the major incidents that took place during the turmoil must be studied in depth along with their consequences. Through this study, we can learn about this period in history and use our knowledge to guide us in our current situation and lead us in our earnest efforts to resort or to restore the righteously guided Khalifa that what they adhere to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Consequently, humanity will find happiness in Allah Jalla Jalla whose religion, Al-Islam, in law, the Sharia, and will finally be able to leave behind its miserable condition which is caused by its distancing from the Quran. 19.2 The wisdom of the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in informing his companions about the upcoming turmoil. So this is where we start about clarifying what the turmoil was about. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam foretold in many hadith that this ummah would become divided and that the Muslims would fight amongst themselves. Many narrations take talk about this either in general or in detail. Some mention the reason for conflict while others discuss its consequences. Some even hint at those who shall stir it up. Much of this Clarification came in the form of answers to the questions posed by the noble companions who witnessed and tasted the great blessing of brotherhood and unity that Allah Jalla Jalaluhu had given 
to them. They went to ask the Prophet وسلم, whether this blessing would last or diminish. Since he knew through revelation that it would not last, he wanted to teach them how to prepare for these conflicts so that they would know how to deal with them the day Allah Jalla Jalaluhu's decreed came for them to occur. This way they would be able to confront them in the right manner as we contemplate the as we contemplate the hadith about these trials and tribulations we find the following points of wisdom some of these hadith point to those responsible for stirring up the conflict they inform us that at times the ones responsible are seemingly of strong faith and strictness in following al-Islam. In spite of this, their hearts and minds are corrupt. These conflicts should expose the hypocrites and refine the hearts of the believers, increasing their faith and preparing them to command the right and forbid the wrong. The information concerning these issues contains a severe warning against becoming involved in the conflict or even getting close to it. This is because when the believers of this ummah, the companions as well as others, hear a hadith saying that some of them will kill and others will cling or cling to worldly pleasures, while some will abandon jihad and commit other types of evil, they feel a strong urge to confront these trials. Consequently, each of them says to himself or herself, I must survive. They then remain in constant fear of falling into the path of destruction unaware. And fear in this case is the most efficient way towards salvation. After mentioning a number of hadith associated with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regarding this dispute and the differences that will take place within the Muslim Ummah in general, Ibn Taymiyyah states this meaning has been preserved from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in many ways. It indicates that division and disagreement will occur within this Ummah. He really or he delivered the warning to his nation so that those for whom Allah Jalla Jalaluhu had written survival could save themselves. Some ahadis specify the correct stance of the Muslimin towards the turmoil. This helps every Muslim and in fact the entire ummah to eliminate the factors that stir up conflict to pass judgment on specific incidents by analyzing the effects or to take a safe stance regarding them right from their beginning stages. Dr. Abdul Aziz Sarif Dukhan has compiled the hadith about the turmoil and studied them in his books. A hadith wa wa a hadith fitna tul fitna haraj and a hadith wa a hadith al fitna tul ula. He has uh, separated the strong narrations from the weak and has derived some points of benefit from the authentic narration. Some of the points are as follows. Allah Jalla Jalaluhu has decreed conflict to occur within every nation, including this one. And it will be so until the final hour. These conflicts uh, will be like pieces of dark night. Uh, those who wander therein will wander mute, deaf and blind. Those who get involved will be destroyed in this world and the hereafter, and those who refrain from participating in them will succeed. None will be able to see where they are going therein, save those whom Allah Jalla Jalaluhu has vitalized through knowledge, uh, provided with Allah Jalla Jalaluhu's consciousness and guided to the truth concerning that over which people differ by his permission. The turmoil of killing will inevitably occur within the Muslim Ummah. No one can deny this or find it strange when it happens, for it has already occurred among the companions and their successors. It will continue throughout the times up until the last day. It is obligatory to know the reasons behind this fighting so that the problem can be fixed or the flames of discord 
can be extinguished whenever they appear in the Muslim land. What no Muslim should do is to just stand by as an apathetic spectator. Through his mercy, Allah Jalla Jalaluhu has granted a remission of sins for this ummah, so the killings, conflict, and earthquakes simply expedite their misdeeds. Some of the narrations state clearly that most of the turmoil would stem from the East. This really was the case in that the first conflict that took place in the Muslim Ummah was stirred up in Kufra and Basra. And the conflict of the camel originated there as well, or the battle of Jamal. In the midst of turmoil, people will sell their religion in exchange for this world. They will follow their whims and doubts. Those who follow the true Islam will become strangers in terms of their conduct and behavior. Those who hold on to their Islam will become like those who hold on to hot coal or spikes of in their hands, uh, patiently waiting to be rewarded for the pain and harm that afflicts them for the sake of their Islam and what they believe to be the truth. When the term oil occurs, Allah Jalla Jalaluhu will protect some people from getting involved. Their hands will not get stained by the blood of the Muslims. Instead, they will strive to make peace among the people and invite others to the fundamentals of true Al-Islam. Mercy and brotherhood, their stance will be undoubtedly regarded as strange in the midst of the raging masses moved by their whims. The tongues is even, or the tongue, excuse me, is even more dangerous than the sword and stirring up conflict. In fact, in most cases, the tongue initiates the problems. Many poisonous words have been inflamed, have inflamed the hearts and stirred emotions finally leading to disastrous conflicts. Through conflict, knowledge decreases. This may be because of the death of scholars, because the scholars prefer to stay safe and isolate themselves, or because it leads people to turn away from them for one reason or another. During turmoil, people take as their leaders ignorant people who then pass verdicts without knowledge. In times like these, worthless fools Prevail. Uh, inshallah, we will, we will stop here on page number 367 and then pick it up. Uh, it appears that, again, these were the, you know, the uh, introductions of... Uh, uh, we're still working on that, uh, of the term oil that actually took the life of Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan. So we will pick up from there. And we still, again, do have a, apparently, a, you know, going to be a good 60, 60 some old videos. Uh, this would be video number 28. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik wa tabaraka asum rabbik wa ta'ala jadduk. Wa la ilaha ghayruk wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-aliyul azim. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik wa tabaraka asum rabbik wa ta'ala jadduk. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.